course, you know, it's my childhood experience, right? I had to evacuate from the bombing of Tokyo, and Tokyo was bombed. The American airplane flew over and it just decimated the town, the city, you know. So that my first experience was evacuation to the country north where uh, children, my brother and myself, can be, you know, not bombed. Uh, then, you know, Japan was bombed, nuclear. They were chosen to use nuclear for energy. It's called peaceful use of nuclear. And Japan really focused in making a lot of uh, power, you know, electric. So I thought the country who had a bomb experience, bombed and experienced the country, how could they do things like that? So um, I became anti-nuclear activist because I knew the, how horrible the bombing, and especially nuclear bombing, it just disappears, you know. Your body, I mean, it was unbelievable the way that I was introduced to the war. I was completely affected by it. A lot of people in Hiroshima, a lot of people in Nagasaki, and those people, you know, escaped in Tokyo and, you know, they couldn't make living in other, you know, countries. So they were like, they become like a beggars, you know. It was terrible that all these, you know, burned people in my town even begging the money and stuff like that. It, it just affect you so deeply in my, you know, in your heart. I started paint as a three years old, maybe. You know, and never stopped painting. So people say, when you start painting, I started painting when I knew it myself. Probably three years old. By six years old, I could paint pretty much a lot of things. I suppose uh, my family didn't make any distinction by boys and girls. And they were very liberated. And uh, as long as you don't make uh, bother other people, do something wrong to the, you know, you can do anything you want. And that was my dad's teaching. You don't know 60s, right? <laughs> you weren't born. I came to New York, and it was a time of, uh, you know, Martin Luther King, marching. I mean, it was liberation of the races and, you know, liberation of women's live, women's liberation. And, so I was very much influenced in what's happening in the 60s in the United States, 60s and 70s and 80s. I was in mostly in the East Coast, so I fully experienced the United States, you know, America. I'm a Buddhist, you know, my practice today actually. Uh, hero temple persons coming. I was very well taken care of by parents, good parents, you know, loved me very much and encouraged me. And my father was a Zen scholar and uh, he taught me the power of concentration. And, that's, and my mother 
was a very beautiful woman, looked like a queen goddess. You know, she was with us most of the time, right, because dad is gone. In the so she showed me how to, you know, make everything. You know, if I was grown up in wartime, so uh, after the war in Japan, nothing was there. So everything we have to make ourselves. <laughs> the donuts you have to really, you know, make ourselves. I remember my mom making, saving all the oils and sugars and make a donut and it was the most delicious thing in my life as a child. It's an etched grass with my art and was done by a really wonderful man, Gary Wagner. It is probably one of the most complex etched grass I've ever seen. He was excellent. You're welcome. So this is my small sort of a meditation area. Twice a day, morning and the night, before I go to, before I get up. And we do uh, actually sitting together with my family my son, Zach, and Iris, his wife, and some people in the farm. I have about uh, six people living in the farm. And some people come for the meditation. It starts at six o'clock, we do 30, uh, 30 minutes. Then twice a week or so, we have uh, yoga about one hour. So today it was a yoga day, so we did a meditation and yoga. Then I come back here in the morning and I do morning meditation. Mujo jin jin mimyo no ho wa Taksen mango ni mo ayo koto katashi Parei ma kenmon shi juji suru koto etari Negawaku wa nyurai no shinjitsu gyo geshi tate matsuran Maka hanya haramita singyo Kanji zai bo sa jo jin hanya haramita ji Jo ken go hun kai ku do es sai ku yaku sha di shi Shiki huri ku ku huri shiki shiki soku ze ku ku soku ze shiki ju so gyo shiki yaku bu no ze cha ri shi ze sho ho ku so hu sho hu metu hu ku hu jo hu zo hu gen ze ko ku tu mu shiki mu ju so gyo shiki Mugen ni bi ze si mu shiki shoko mi shoku ho Mugen kai nai si mu hi shiki kai mu mu myo Yaku mu mu myo jin nai si mu ro si Yaku mu ro si jin mu ku shu metsu do mu chi Yaku mu tok i mu shou tok to go dai sat 
ジョーム編成願堂本能無人性願堂訪問無料性願学仏道無常性願上So this book was published, uh, I think, in 81 and 88 and 89, three times. And it sold quite a bit of a book, and the people realized there's a woman named Mayumi Oda painting a goddesses. And it just, because I painted so much goddesses, just I made the title called Goddesses. And I thought anybody was not, wasn't interested in goddesses, but it was a time of the women's liberation, women's spirituality. I hit in the right time. So it was a luck and maybe synchronicity, you know. All over from Mesopotamia, Egypt, this book that only is my, you know, personal story. So it, it basically talks about how I grew up. So, but anyway, since I did a paint a lot of goddesses, I just made it to the goddesses. But after all, then I was very much influenced by a lot of uh, goddesses all over the world. And a Hawaiian goddess, Pere, you know, Poriyahu. A lot of goddesses. Saraswati. Japanese called Benten Sama, Benzaiten. And she's a, a goddess of creativity, art, and music. And also, goddess of money. And because uh, Saraswati is a goddess of a river, a river flows from high place to low place, right? So it's the same, same thing with the money. Money is like a water, you know, power goes from high to low. So a uh, river goddess really takes care of your commerce, your business. And that's how I, uh, Saraswati really helped me. And also Saraswati is the one told me to do anti-nuclear work because Japan was going through really crazy over the plutonium and you try to use it as a power source. And I thought, what the hell <laughs> my country is doing? It's crazy. So I became anti-nuclear activist in 1992. Well, they did everything to try to, you know, stop us. I'm, basically, I sued the Japanese government. <laughs> you sued them? I sued them. Internationally. 
it was kind of scary. You know, you can get killed easy. But I wasn't living in Japan. I was living in San Francisco then. So I didn't get, you know, yeah, international suit and uh, incredibly creative, wonderful uh, international lawyer came to my dinner. It's just everything is synchronistically happens, you know. When the things you try to do meant to be the one you should. So this man named Julian Gresser came to my dinner because he's a practitioner of Zen too. You know, he did Zazen, he did a lot of, you know, martial art. And he came over to my dinner table and said, hey, why don't we sue the government? I know that. <laughs> and he turned out to be the, uh, the working for uh, government, Japanese uh, government, as an international lawyer too. So he knew the prime minister of Japan. So the guy who knew the prime minister basically suing the prime minister with, you know, with us, our organization. You know, I thought I can, you know, buy the uh, international newspaper ad, like a New York Times, right? The Japanese government doing a terrible things. It will cost you $20,000. But I didn't have to pay for it, you know. It was all over newspaper that we sued the government. So it did win because uh, Japan uh, couldn't stop, couldn't do uh, plutonium, plutonium things. I mean, it basically then a lot of things happened and they started, you know, make a lot of uh, failure and this and that and just... It's, itself it didn't work. So they got in trouble by themselves and the, the suing definitely scared them, probably, very much. The uh, amazing country was Nauru. You know, it's a little island. Uh, in Pacific. It's almost now, I think it's uh, almost like the island's gone because of the uh, global warming and water is going up. And uh, he's, he was the one to sue too. But a lot of, lots of other countries, you know, Brazil, I mean, all Asian countries, uh, people in your age. I mean, renewable energy is really, really developed, right? Wind, solar, geothermal, a lot of way to make energy and it's just the most expensive way to make energy is nuclear. <laughs> so it's not, you know, economically it's not feasible anymore. It doesn't make any sense. I was just painting when uh, uh, Professor Marshall uh, that came over and uh, I was painting, this is a Kuan Yin, but this is a hot sutra, it's a Kuan Yin, the sutra of a Kuan Yin, how great she is. And these are all the back of this painting. This is the one that I did. And this is a card, small, but that one's so big, right? Tanka.
as I told you, that I grew up in, right after the war, and the food was so scarce. And my grandparents did a very small but garden in my yard. And, uh, you know, that's the way you can eat. Tomatoes, potatoes, and, you know, pumpkins, and you grow, then you can eat. So you don't stop, you know. People really experience the starvation, really understand how important the food is. So I bought this uh, farm, about five acres we have, 2,000, and I started to do this farm. But now my son and his wife is taking over the farm, and he's they're doing a beautiful job. And so I named the Ginger Hill Farm because it, it was a, actually, it was already named when I bought it. But it was a ranch, it was nothing, no, but nothing was growing. So we developed, I developed a farm for maybe 15 years or so, maybe 10, yeah. Then my son came over, took care about seven years ago. Now it's his farm, and his, he and his wife is doing a wonderful job. So that I paint. Basically, it's a farm, farm to table that we don't, you know, we hope not to buy food. And the wonderful thing is like a coconuts and the sugar cane, they really quench our thirst. Sugar cane water is so beautiful, you know, juice, sugar cane juice. And you squeeze a lemon, that is so plenty now. It makes really wonderful juice. I did paint uh, I don't paint that much anymore, but you know, how may I? It's a Hawaiian goddess of a, you know, pretty, all beautiful farm and sea. Mm. We don't grow rice too well here. Yeah. I tried, but didn't succeed. So the, the rice is definitely the one. And we don't process the sugar, so we buy sugar. Pretty much everything we can eat, but uh, ch chives, shallots, these are shallots, parsley, and the red shiso. Cilantro. A lot of things you can grow here. You know, I learned basic organic, you know. But there's a many different methods and I'm just, I do whatever convenient for me. I just don't use the pesticides and, you know. You know, my grandmother did it, so. They weren't terribly good at it because they are city people. We had a persimmon tree and uh, pears. You pull the weed and just put it back. So it becomes soil, yeah. upside down so that root, you know, root doesn't go back. Probably turmeric is the most important thing, you know. We make a powder and we make a tea sometimes. Four goats, two chickens, now we only have a three boy 
pigs. We had a lot of female pigs and they had a babies and too much to take care so we stopped doing it. So we just kept the three boy pigs and gave up female. So I think we have to eat it sometimes. Mm. But they all have a names, you know. Once you have a names, so you can't eat it, you know. Wow, this is really big, so maybe I'll go get it. Boy. <laughs>